Welcome to my Security Plus Lecture Review. Here we're looking at the book CompTIA Security Plus Guide to Network Security Fundamentals 5th Edition. Here we're looking at Chapter 6, which is the continuation of cryptography. Chapter 6 is the advanced portion. Uh, mainly what we're going to be talking about here is more digital certificates, uh, asymmetrical and symmetrical certificate keys, Describe the uh, key exchange, uh, public key infrastructure. List the tasks associated with key management. And describe the different transport encryption protocols. That's actually very important when we start talking about like VPN and key exchanges. Alright, so a digital certificate is a common application for cryptography. It typically is a digital key. Using digital certificates involve things like understanding what they are, what, what's its purpose, knowing how they're managed, and determining the type of certificate that's appropriate in the many different types of situations that can occur. It's used to uh, prove a document uh, authenticity, that it really came from the appropriate sender, it can be used for integrity. However, the weakness of using a digital certificate is they only show that the private key of the sender was used to encrypt the digital signature. Imposters could post a public key under a sender's name. Also, these keys can be forged. Here's an example. Bob's public key uh, he is sending the statement by the stock now. Someone will intercept it and then create the imposter's keys and then will forward it on. When Mallory sends a different message, it will go to the imposter, not Bob. We also have what's called these trusted third parties. Typically, these are called certificate authorities and they're used to help solve the problem of verifying identities. We trust these third parties, so what they issue we trust. For example, VeriSign. VeriSign is a very popular certificate authority. We trust VeriSign, so certificates issued through VeriSign, we trust, we inherently trust them. A digital certificate is a technology used to associate a user's identity to a public key. That way, it, that digital signature is trusted by that third party because that third party has verified that individual. Information that's typically uh, contained in the digital certificate is the name, the public key, the issuer's name, the issuer's digital signature, the digital certificate serial number, and a expiration date. For example, I have Google popped up. I'm going to look at the certificate. It is issued to Google. It is issued by the Google Internet Authority, G2. It is valid between those times. If we look at details, we can see its serial number. We can see its SHA value. We could see the names associated with it. We can see keys, we can see more details. And we can also see its certi uh, certification path. GeoTrust Global Certificate Authority trusts Google Internet Authority. So they issue Google.com certificate. We trust GeoTrust Global. They trust Google Internet Authority. So we inherently trust them and so forth. I did this through Internet Explorer because it's a little bit easier to grab the lock symbol. So that way you can actually see there is an owner's name, its public key, the issuer's name, and sig uh, signature, and serial number. Signa uh, serial number, that way you can verify that it is legit. That way it makes it harder to forge, even though not impossible. Alright, techno technology used for actually managing and dispersing those certificates. We have a certificate authority, which is the top. They 
contract out to registration authorities, RAs, and then they become certificate repositories. These certificate authorities serve as a trusted third party for verification. They are responsible for issuing these certificates. A CA can be a internal or external to an organization because you can have an internal certificate authority that is trusted just by that organization. So that would not be a global certificate authority, that would be a local or an internal certificate authority. So what are the duties of a certificate authority? Big thing is they distribute the certificates. They generate, issue, and distribute the keys for those certificates. They do publish certificate status. They also provide the means to, uh, for subscribing to request revocation. Basically, if you want to revoke a certificate, they have that ability. That way, when you go to verify a certificate, you can make sure that it hasn't been revoked. They focus on maintaining the availability the security and the continuity of the certificates and the signing function. A subscriber requests a digital certificate. What happens? Well, I want a new certificate for my website. I have to generate a certificate signing request, a CSR. I put things like my company's name, my department, my address, what domain, do I want it www.domain.com? Do I want it mail.domain.com? Do I want a wildcard? Do I want star or anything dot mydomain.com? And then I submit it to a certificate authority. The CA will insert the public key into the certificate after they've verified my information. And then those certificates are digitally signed with my private key. Or, sorry. They're signed with the private key of the issuing certificate authority, and then they're sent to me for me to install. The registration authority is a subordinate entity designed to handle specific CA tasks, such as registration function. We don't need to bog down the certificate authority for basic registration issues. That's where the RA comes in. They receive, authenticate, and process the, the certificate revoke requests. They also deal with the identity and authentication of the subscribers and the certificate requesters. General duties are things like obtaining a public key from the subscriber. Verify that the subscriber possesses the appropriate asymmetric private key. Primary function is to verify the identity of an individual. If I say I own this website and this website is uh, supporting this organization, they want to verify that I'm authorized to speak on that organization. The means of a digital certificate requester to identify themselves to an RA, it could be in person, it could be submitting documents, it could be email. However, email is typically not appropriate, so they may require you to post like a key file at the root of your domain, or they may have to prove your identity one way or another, depending on the register of the authority's policy. We have what is uh, known as a, a certificate repository. This is a publicly accessible, centralized directory of digital certificates. That's how we can verify that our certificates are legit. They can be used to view certificate statuses. They can also be managed locally by setting up a storage area connected to a certificate authority server. Basically with this is, it's a library of certificates that verify their status to make sure they're legitimate. The certificate revocation is a list of digital certificates that have been revoked. Reasons for revoke could be no longer used. It could be that the details have changed. It could be that the private key has been compromised. It could also be the date is no longer valid or the certificate is now suspect. We have what's called a CRL, 
a certificate revocation list, and this is a list of certificate serial numbers that have been revoked for better management. So let's talk about managing the certificates. We have what's called an OCSP, or an Online Certificate Status Protocol, and they are uh, made to do real-time lookups of, certif of certificate statuses. That way, we can verify that they are real. They are called a Request Response Protocol. Basically, when you open up a browser, you go to a secured site, the browser will send the certificate's information to the trusted entity, uh, the OCSP responder, and they'll provide an immediate revocation information on that certificate if they are invalid. OCSP stapling is a variation of OSCP where the web server sends a query to the responder at a regular interval to receive a signed uh, time and a stamp response. That way you can know, you know, every 30 seconds that this has been signed, you know, 20 seconds ago, that, so it's still valid. That way, certain pages will load a little quicker. That way, you don't have to worry about the browser opening up, sending a query out, it getting the response, as opposed to the OSCP stapling. You request the page, the page comes because it's time stamped as legitimate ex seconds ago. Here is the OCSP stapling. You connect to a web server and it goes all the way through. All right. There are different types of categories for digital certificates. There are personal certificates, server certificates, and software or software publisher certificates. Class one, a, a personal certificate is issued by a RA directly to individuals. This is frequently used to secure email. Class two is a server certificate. This is typically issued to like a web server to a to a web server to serve clients. It ensures like authenticity of the web server and it ensures the authenticity of the cryptograph connection to the web server. When you go to your bank website for example, bank with Wells Fargo, how do you verify Wells Fargo is Wells Fargo? You do that through its certificate. We trust the certificate, so we trust that website. There is a key exchange. Uh, client will do a hello. We'll get crypto uh, information back. Server will send a hello. We tell what algorithm supported the server. We'll also send its digital certificate. There will be a key exchange, which is the pre-master secret. And then it will actually then have verification and then it will move forward. Class 2 also deals with server authentication and secured communication combined into one certificate. It will display a padlock typically in the web browser depending on the web browser. Also if we're looking at the extended validation or EVSSL these will require more extensive verification of the legitimacy of the business. So there are different classes of certificates. It just depends on which certificate and the price you want to pay. Sometimes cheaper is not always better. Example would be like this, which we've already looked at. Class three are software publishers and this is typically provided to the software publisher to verify the program. That way, make sure that the program wasn't modified. We also have what's called an X509 digital certificate, and this is the standard for the most widely accepted format of our digital certificates. These certificates follow the standards that can be read and written to by any application that follows the appropriate standard. Uh, currently, we're on the version 3 of the X509 standard. We have different field names, and they provide very specific options, like uh, version numbers, serial numbers, issuers, validation period, subject name, 
the issuer unique ID, subject unique ID, the extension and signatures, these are all within a, digi a digital certificate. The importance of uh, the management for our certificates are how we deal with key exchanges. And that is actually part of the aspect of our PKI, or public key uh, exchange. Though typically our PKI have things like a trusted model that deals with the public key cryptography standards for key exchanging, which we're going to get into on our next slide. So there is a need for a consistent means to manage these certificates, and that is that what our PKI is. Our PKI is our public key infrastructure, and that is just the framework for everything that's involved with our certificates. So the certificate management can facilitate through our PKI is the creation, storage, distribution, and revoke of our keys. And again, typically we can have an internal or external PKI. A lot of companies that will go mass amounts of certificates might have their own internal PKI for easeability uh, and ease of management. All right, let's go back to some of our standards. So we have what's called a public key cryptography standard, PKCS, and there are numbers of sets of PKI standards defined by like very specific uh, organizations, like the RSA Corporation, and these are widely accepted in the industry based on the RSA public key algorithm. The PKCS is composed of 15 standards detailed in the next table. Actually, detailed in figure 6.3 in our book, so not on the next table, because on the next table is actually a, a different one. And here we have three of the big, five of the big ones. We have our DIR, we have our Base64, we have our uh, CMSS uh, certificates, that would be our P7B standard. We also have things like our uh, PIX, our Personal Information Exchange, and then we have our Microsoft version or our SSTs. Again, these are just different types of standard formats for our key exchange. We were talking about our trust model before. Trust is the confidence in or the reliance on another entity. Where our trust model refers to the type of trust relationship that can exist, typically between the individuals, individuals and entities, or between the entities themselves. We have a direct trust, which is the type of trust model where one person knows the other person, and so that is a different type of trust. We have a third-party trust, where two individuals trust each other because they trust a third party. And again, that's like, we trust VeriSign because we trust them. So if I trust them, and you trust them, to a degree, I trust you. We have a hierarchy trust model, which is assigned a single hierarchy with one master, typically called a CA root, and this root will sign all certificates uh, below them with a single key. They can be used in an organization where one CA is responsible for the entire organization. There are some limitations. There is a single CA private key that could be uh, compromised, rendering all certificates issued by that certificate authority invalid. Here we go. We have our trusted hierarchy model. If the key at the top level is compromised, all certificates issued by that certificate authority are invalid. We have a distributed trust model where we have multiple CAs signing digital certificates, and this eliminates the limitation of a hierarchy trust model. That is what the internet uses. We have VeriSign, we have GeoTrust, we have multiple distributed trust uh, trust certificate authorities, and that way we don't just have to rely on one. We have a bridge trust model, and this is where one certificate acts as a, 
facilitator to interconnect mo uh, other certificate authorities. Here we have again our certificate authorities and we have intermediate certificate authorities. This is very similar to the way our internet functions. We have our main certificate authorities and then they have intermediate certificate authorities that work underneath them on their behalf. Here we may have a, a bridge model and that's where we have multiple, multiple certificate authorities and we have a bridge between the certificate authorities so that they can share information. So we, going back to the management portion of this, we have a certificate policy or a CP and this is a published set of rules that govern those PKIs and they provide recommendation baseline security requirements for operating a certificate authority and RA and other major components. That way we at least have a base level of security as it relates to protecting our certificates our certificate authorities and all components in the issuing process. We have a certificate practice statement, a CPS, and this is typically a technical document that describes how uh, to use and how to manage certificates. They can also cover how to register, how to issue, how to revoke, and the procedure for controlling the uh, key pair management. We have a life cycle, create, suspension, revoke, expiration, and then it goes back. Create will occur after a user is uh, positively identified. Suspension, which may or may not occur. This may occur when employees leave, uh, leave or they have a leave of absence. Revoke, that's where the certificate's no longer valid. And then expiration is where the key is no longer being used there are ways to store our keys and these are the means of our public key storage and this is embedding them within the certificate of, uh, digital certificates there are means for storing the private keys software keys also we could store them in hardware like a smart card or a token key usage and that's where we have multiple pairs of dual keys that can be created if more security is needed than a single set of public private keys we can generate more than one pair one pair two pair three pair and so forth key handling could also be part of a key escrow and that's where the keys are managed by a third party such as a trusted certificate authority so private keys are split and each half is encrypted two halves sent to a third party which will store each half in separate locations. That way, if half is compromised, not all is compromised. We also have the expiration, and the keys will expire after X set amount of time. We have what's called the key handling process, and this is that will handle things like renewals, revocation, and recovery. Because recovery may be needed to recover keys if an employee is hospitalized for an extended period of time. So the employee is not there, so how do you recover their keys? Typically we have a key recovery agent, and that's typically what's used. A group of many people may be used for a recovery agent. So here we go, we have a group uh, M and N. And so we could actually have multiple people tied to a key, but they could actually have subsections. We have, again, suspension and the destruction of those keys as well. One of our last major topics is our cryptography transport protocols. We have two major types, SSL and TLS, though it has been said that SSL are slowly going away. And this is a very common transport algorithm. And its design goal was to create an encrypt data path between a client and a server, where the transport layer security, TLS, it's version 1.1, 1 
and it is more it is more significantly secure than the newer versions of SSL. They deal with things like the cipher suites, which is a name combination of the encryption authentication and message authentication code or MAC algorithm that are used both with SSL and TLS. The length of keys are a determining factor in the overall security of the transmission. Typically, the larger the key, the better. We're going for 2048-bit keys or the 40. 96. The 4096 are the stronger keys, and that's what we should be going after. We have our secure shell, or SSH, which is, I'm not quite sure why we have to talk about this in this chapter, but it is a protocol similar to Telnet, but it's better secured. And it has a suite of utilities like S-Login, SSH, and the secure copy protocol, or SCP. It works very similar to Telnet. Here we have the appropriate Unix commands, our login, RCP, RSH, and kind of what they do. We also have what's called HTTPS, or Hypertext Protocol over SSL, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. This is the secured version of HTTP. And it uses either and or TLS and SSL. Again, the secure version is actually plain HTTP, which is sent over SSL or TLS. Hence the HTTP over SSL or HTTP over TLS. Typically, it uses port 443. And you always see that as it's denoted in the URL as HTTPS instead of just HTTP. When we went to Google earlier, you'll notice it was HTTPS. We have one of the last major protocols for our VPN technology, IPsec, or IP security. This was a way to increase the security of the internet protocol. And again, this is a suite of protocols, and it's used to encrypt and authenticate each IP packet. IPsec considered to be a transparent protocol and it is transparent to the following items application users and software they don't realize it's happening ipsec provides three areas key management confidentiality and authentication it does support two encryption modes transport and tunnel tunnel will encrypt both the header and the the data where transport will only encrypt the data we add it to a new packet, and that's how we get it encrypted. Well, that's not how we get it, but that's the foundation of how it works. And that is the end of our chapter. We talked about different types of CAs, uh, the different formats. We talked about PKI, uh, and again, cryptography as it flows through the network with SSL and TLS. And we did a very basic uh, overview of IPsec. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any comments, again, please let me know. Thank you.